Welcome to the Hand in Hand with God channel, where the sermons are filled with the Word of God, so you can apply God's truth to your life as you glean them from the teachings that are brought to you by myself, Pastor Daryl Clausen. But more importantly, they're brought to you by the Holy Spirit. Apply God's truth to your life so that He can mold you and shape you into who He wants you to be so that you can shine bright for Him through your words and actions. God bless you as you watch the video. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Hand in Hand with God, a flowing fountain lifestyle, a time where we gather together in a corporate setting to delve into the Word of God with open hearts so we can allow the Word of God to mold us and shape us into who He wants us to be, so that our minds will be transformed by the Word of God, so that we will know what God's good, perfect, and pleasing will is. Let's open with a word of prayer, and then we'll delve into the Word of God. Father God Almighty King, we thank you, Lord, for this time that we can gather together in a corporate setting with our siblings in Christ Jesus to delve into your word, Father God, and to glean the truths that are in your word and uh, apply them to our lives with the assistance of the Holy Spirit. Father, we thank you for the week that you safely brought each of us through and brought us back together, Father God. Lord, we dedicate this time to you and thank you for being here in our midst, Father. Thanks again, Father God, for this time that we can delve into your word. I pray, Lord, that each of us has come with open hearts to hear from you what you have to say to us today. And I pray, Lord, that each of us will take the truths from your word and work with the Holy Spirit to apply them to our lives, Father. And Lord, as I give your message, I pray that I do so in a clear, concise manner so that it's easy for your children and those who aren't to hear the truth that's in your word so that they can apply it to their life, Father. We thank you and praise your holy name. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to take this opportunity to once again welcome you to Hand in Hand with God. We're glad that each of you came out this afternoon. If it's your first time, welcome. And if it's your repeat time, thanks for coming back. My name is Daryl Clausen and I'll be sharing the Word of God with you today. Today's sermon is entitled Jesus and Compassion. First things first, let's start with the definition of compassion. According to Bing.com, compassion is sympathetic pity and concern for the sufferings or misfortunes of others. Throughout Jesus' ministry, we see that he was sympathetic and concerned when he saw that the people who came to listen to him were suffering physically or spiritually. Jesus healed the sick, the blind, delivered people from satanic bondage, and fed people both physical food and spiritual truths, all because he was compassionate towards them. Spiritual Nourishment, Matthew 9, verses 35 to 38. As Jesus went around ministering to the people, he saw that people who came to hear what he had to say were not being cared of spiritually. Let's read Matthew 9, verses 35 to 38. And when Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every affliction, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. And verse 38, Therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. 
The only way that someone can be cared for spiritually is for someone to give him or her spiritual food. And the only way that someone can be given spiritual food, which is the truth contained within the Word of God, is for someone to tell them God's truth. This is visible in Romans 10 verses 8 to 15. But what does it say? The Word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is, the Word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. Verses 12 and 13. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And verse 15, And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Out of compassion, Jesus gave people spiritual truth because that is what they needed. We too, as followers of Christ, must do the same. If we don't have compassion for the lost and want them to experience salvation through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, then we must do some serious soul searching and ask God to help us have compassion for our fellow human beings who have poor spiritual health so that they too can experience his gift of salvation. Jesus' Priority, Matthew 14, verses 10 to 21. Life wasn't always easy for Jesus. Just like us, he experienced the ups and downs in his life. Jesus knew all of the Old Testament, which means he knew every prophecy that pertained to him. Therefore, he knew the role that John the Baptist played in biblical prophecy. Jesus didn't only know John the Baptist as a colleague, if you will, but he was also his cousin. Let's read Matthew 14, verses 10 to 21. He sent and had John beheaded, this is talking about King Herod, in the prison. And his head was brought on a platter and given to the girl, and she brought it to her mother. And his disciples came and took the body and buried it, and they went and told Jesus. Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, and healed their sick. Now when it was evening, the disciples came to him, and said, This is a desolate place, and the day is now over. Send the crowds away to go into the villages, and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. And they said to him, We have only five loaves here and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass, and taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds. And verses 20 and 21. And they all ate and were satisfied, and they took up twelve baskets full of the broken pieces left over. And those who ate were five thousand men, besides women and children. Jesus' cousin had just been killed by King Herod, 
And as with any one of us, when we have a close family member or friend who passes away, would like to have some time by ourselves to grieve. Jesus' plan was to do this, but his time of grieving was cut short because he had compassion for the needs of the people who came to hear him speak. Jesus could very well have said to himself and to the people, a cousin of mine was just killed by Herod, and I need four days to grieve. Please leave me alone. However, he didn't. The compassion that Jesus had for the people overrode his necessity to grieve for the loss of his cousin John. Therefore, Jesus healed the sick and even went so far as to feed them as well physical needs. Matthew 14 verses 15 to 21. In Matthew 14 verses 10 to 21, we saw how Jesus prioritized his life. He put aside his needs and took care of the needs of others. And in verses 15 to 21, we saw how Jesus took care of the people's physical needs as well. The Bible tells of Jesus feeding two large masses of people. One group was at least 4,000 and the other group 5,000. In both accounts, the Bible only states the number of men who were fed, but there were also women and children who were in each group. Therefore, the number of people in each miracle of feeding could easily be doubled. In Matthew 14 verses 15 to 21, we see that Jesus cares about our physical needs. We all need to eat because eating gives us energy to navigate our day. Even though the people had come to see Jesus when he wanted to be alone, after he took time to heal the sick, he chose not to send the people away, but wanted his disciples to provide food for them. The disciples gathered together five loaves of bread and two fish and brought them to Jesus. Jesus had the people sit down and he said a blessing. The disciples gave the food to the people. Everybody ate as much as they wanted and there were even leftovers. Sicknesses and ailments, blindness. Matthew 20 verses 29 to 34. Jesus had compassion when he saw people who had a physical or a spiritual need. Sometimes the person with the need asked Jesus for help, and there are other times in which the Bible tells us that Jesus had compassion on people, took it upon himself, and took care of the need, such as the account of the feeding of the 5,000 and 4,000 men. The next account of Jesus' healing because of his compassion for the individual which we are going to look at is of two blind men who were outside of Jericho. Jesus had been in Jericho and now it was time to leave and lots of people were following him. Let's read the story taken from Matthew 20 verses 29 to 34. And as they went out of Jericho, a great crowd followed him. And behold, there were two blind men sitting by the roadside. And when they heard that Jesus was passing by, they cried out, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. The crowd rebuked them, telling them to be silent. But they cried out all the more, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. And stopping, Jesus called them and said, What do you want? me to do for you. They said to him, Lord, let our eyes be opened. And Jesus in pity touched their eyes and immediately they recovered their sight and followed him. The two blind men knew that Jesus could make them see again. Therefore, they raised their voices all the more to get Jesus' attention, even though the crowd around Jesus told them to stop calling out to Jesus. In Jesus' compassion, he responded to their cry of help to him to be healed, and they were healed of their blindness. Leprosy, 
Mark 1, verses 39 to 45. Jesus' compassion went beyond social norms, and we see this clear as day when Jesus heals lepers or associates with the less desirable people in society. Let's read Mark 1, verses 39 to 45. And he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. And a leper came to him, imploring him, and kneeling, said to him, If you will, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, he stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him, and he was made clean. And Jesus sternly charged him, and sent him away at once, and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest, and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for a proof to them. But he went out and began to talk freely about it, and to spread the news, so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town, but was out in desolate places, and people were coming to him from every quarter. Jesus healed this man of his leprosy because he had compassion on him. Jesus wanted this man to follow what God commanded through Moses centuries earlier. The man was to go to the priest, and the priest would look him over, and because Jesus had healed him, the priest would obviously declare that he was healed, because there wouldn't have been any trace of leprosy found on his body. During Jesus' ministry on earth, the law of Moses was still in effect. I believe that Jesus instructed this man to go to the priests, thus honor the law of Moses, because Jesus came to fulfill the law, not to destroy it, nor to rebel against it. We see this from Jesus' own words in Matthew 5, verses 17 to 18, which says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. I would say that the man was so excited that he was now healed from leprosy, that he didn't want to waste any time talking with the priest, nor offering the required Mosaic law offering. Instead, he went and told a lot of people that Jesus had healed him of his leprosy. Even though it is good to tell people what Jesus has done for us, we must, first and foremost, be obedient to him and do what he asks us to do. Provision, Luke 7, verses 11 to 16. The economics of Jesus' day are quite different from today. Back then, a male was needed to provide for the family, whereas today, anyone can work, and if you're having difficulty making ends meet, you can always apply to get money from the government. When Jesus saw the funeral procession, he knew how important the man whose body was being carried was to his mother, not just because because of the relationship that they had, but also for her ability to have what she needed to survive. Jesus didn't need to be asked to perform a miracle. In this case, he just took the initiative to raise the widow's son from the dead because he had compassion on her. Let's read the story taken from Luke 7, verses 11 to 16. Soon afterward, he went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a great crowd went with him. As he drew near to the gate of the town, behold, a man who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a considerable crowd from the town was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her, and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came up and touched the bier, and the bearers stood still. 
And he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized them all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has arisen among us, and God has visited his people. It is true that actions speak louder than words, and something done out of compassion for somebody else, even if it wasn't requested, but was most definitely a need which needed to be fulfilled, will change an individual's life forever. I encourage you to live your life listening to the Holy Spirit for the moment or moments when he gives you instructions to do something out of compassion for somebody else, which will be precisely what that person needs, thus giving them an opportunity to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, or deepening their existing relationship with God. Spiritual Bondage, Mark 5 verses 1 to 20. Demonic possession is no challenge for Jesus, because he is God. Therefore, when Jesus had compassion on people who were demon-possessed, he would deliver them from the satanic bondage that they were in. Let's read the biblical account from Mark 5 verses 1 to 20 about a man who gets delivered from being demon-possessed. They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him any more, not even with a chain. For he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart, and he broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Day and night among the tombs and on the mountains he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I adjure you, by God, do not torment me. For he was saying to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, What is your name? He replied, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now a great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. And they begged him, saying, Send us to the pigs, let us enter them. Verse 13. So he gave them permission, and the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs. And the herd numbered about two thousand, rushed down the steep bank into the sea, and drowned in the sea. The herdsmen fled, and told it in the city, and in the country, and people came to see what it was that had happened. And they came to Jesus, and saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had had the legion, sitting there, clothed, and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs. And they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with demons begged him that he might be with him. And he did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends, and tell them how much the Lord has done for you, and how he has had mercy on you. And verse 20, And he went away, and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and everyone marveled. From this passage, I'd like to highlight verses 18 to 20. Sometimes Jesus would tell people not to mention what he did for them. 
And then there are others with whom he would do the opposite, such as the leper who was previously mentioned. Jesus wanted the fellow who was demon-possessed here in Mark 5 verses 1 to 20 to tell others how compassionate the Lord had been towards him by setting him free from being demon-possessed. How about you? How faithful are you with telling those whom you come into contact with about what God has done for you and the times that Jesus has been compassionate to you and set you free from demonic possession or oppression or whatever else he has done for you. Spiritual Health, John 10 verses 6 to 18. Compassion was an important feeling in Jesus' life. It is because Jesus had compassion on people who had poor health, were demon-possessed, or spiritually hungry that he rectified their situation. We could go so far as to say that Jesus had compassion on all of humanity because of our sinful nature. A synonym of compassion is to care. In the same manner that Jesus had compassion on the people because they didn't have a spiritual leader leading them, Jesus cares about people's salvation. Therefore, he was willing to lay down his life for us because he had compassion on us due to our sinful nature. Let's read John 10 verses 6 to 18. This figure of speech or parable Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. In John 10 verses 6 to 18, Jesus says that he is the Good Shepherd. It is the shepherd's responsibility to provide everything for his sheep. The sheep who belong to Jesus are the people who have, or are going to, turn their life over to Christ, asking God to forgive them of their sins and cleanse them from all of their unrighteousness. Jesus knew what had to be done for his sheep or the people to be taken care of spiritually, which was for him to submit himself to the will of Father God and be crucified for our sins, only to be raised from the dead three days later. Jesus' compassion played a very important role in his ministry on earth, and even today as he sits at God's right hand.
The compassion that Jesus had towards people compelled Jesus to make sure that people were fed, healed from sicknesses, blindness, and leprosy, and delivered from demonic possession. Also, it was due to the love that Jesus has towards the human race, who, because of our sinful nature, cannot have a healthy relationship with God, that helped him lay down his life so that people can experience God's gift of salvation. John 3:16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. 1 Peter 5, verses 6 to 7 says, Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him, because he cares for you. You cannot care for someone without having compassion towards them. The good news is that Jesus still cares for people. Therefore, he can still assist you in your current situation because he will still have compassion on you. The clincher that we see here in 1 Peter 5 verses 6 to 7 is that we have to humble ourselves before God and give to him what concerns us. If we don't believe that Jesus still does good things out of compassion or because he cares, then we will not choose to be humble before God. Thus we will not experience God lifting us up when the time is right. All because we figured that we could handle the situation ourselves instead of giving it to God and asking Him to help us through it. In conclusion, remember that God is compassionate. We know this because Jesus is compassionate and Jesus is God. Humble yourself before God and choose to give Him the issues in your life that concern you and trust Him to take care of those situations for you because He compassionately cares about every aspect of your life regardless of how insignificant you may think your situation would be perceived. Time to pray. If God displays something on your heart, then take that up with Him directly. As for the rest of you, I invite you to pray a corporate prayer with me. The words will be on the screen for that. In the corporate prayer, there's an opportunity to accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you haven't done that yet. And then we'll talk to God about us, seeing Him as a compassionate God, who He is. Let's pray. Lord God, you are the only wise God. You are in a class all by yourself. There is none like you, because you are the only holy, true, eternal, and almighty God. And I worship you for those reasons amongst others. Heavenly Father, I confess that I have sinned against you. And repenting of my sins, I ask God that you forgive me of all my sins and cleanse me from all unrighteousness, because I believe that Jesus Christ is your Son, who died for my sins and whom you raised from the dead. Father God, I thank you that I am now baptized into Christ, baptized with the Holy Spirit, thus sealed by the Holy Spirit into your kingdom. I ask God that you would also fill me with the Holy Spirit. Father God, I surrender my life to you, making Jesus the Lord of my life. Father in heaven, you are omniscient, omnipresent, and omnipotent, and I thank you for the relationship that I have with you through faith in Jesus Christ. Lord God Almighty, I praise and worship you for being a compassionate God. I thank you that we have examples of Jesus during his ministry on earth, being compassionate towards people in every aspect of their life. Lord God, 
I ask you to forgive me for not believing that you are as compassionate as you are. And I ask you to help me grasp just how compassionate of a God you are. As such, Father God, I ask you to help me believe that you care about every aspect of my life and want to help me with whatever trial and tribulation I am facing. I pray this to you, Father God, because you are the eternal God who reigns supreme and created all things for your pleasure. In Jesus' name, amen. If you meaningfully prayed that prayer, welcome to the family of God. And I pray that you follow through and choose to work with the Holy Spirit to apply the truth that we heard in today's sermon to your life so that you can grow closer to God and have a stronger relationship with Him. I'll close with a word of prayer. Father God, Almighty King, we thank you, Lord, for your involvement in our lives, Father. Thank you, God, that you are a compassionate God. We see that in the Old Testament, and we see that in the New Testament through the ministry of Jesus, and we most definitely see it in the testimony of our life with how you've been compassionate towards us, Father God. Help us, Lord, to know that you are compassionate, to realize just how compassionate of a God you are, Father God. Help us to choose to surrender everything to you because we know that you will help us through it and take care of it with us and for us, Father God. Lord God, you're faithful and true and you are holy and just. I pray, Father, that you go with each of us as we go our separate ways this week and that we notice even the little things that you do for us, Father God. And I ask that you bring each of us back safely next week for another time to learn more about you in a corporate setting, Father. We thank you and praise your holy name. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you guys for coming. God bless you. Go with God and no one else. Have a wonderful week. God bless you. God bless you. Go with God and no one else. Thanks for watching.